All right, welcome. Today we'll be discussing my personal favorite philosopher, writer, thinker. Uh, this is something I've been trying to set up for quite a while. I'm quite excited about it. It is Arthur Schopenhauer, and it's uh, the three best amateur Schopenhauer scholar enthusiasts I could find uh, in this corner of the internet. Uh, I'm joined by Pessimistic Idealism, uh, who has a YouTube channel where he covers uh, other idealist philosophers. I'm joined by Erval, who some of you may be familiar with. He also has a YouTube channel where he covers a range of topics, uh, perennial philosophy, um, politics, or things. And I'm joined by Tom, who I found on Twitter, who also shares a mutual love of, uh, of Schopenhauer. So yeah, how are you guys doing? If you'd just like to give some brief introductions, um, I'll start with you, Ryan, Pessimistic Idealism. Sure. Hello, I'm uh, Ryan, or PI, or Pessimistic Idealism. I am a uh, recently graduate in uh, philosophy and history, and I do a lot of work in uh, revivif uh, revivifying the life of British idealists and American idealists through um, their primary sources that we can gather around and try and bring it to the forefront of the internet, essentially. So I've been doing a lot of audiobooks, um, as well as a lot of uh, historical work as well. So trying to bring idealism back into the forefront of contemporary philosophy. So that's me. <laughs> and Erval? Yeah, my name's Eric or Erval on YouTube. I've been around for about a decade, uh, give or take. And I get into all sorts of different ideas, speculative theories about history. Um, I'm actually a big fan of the Atlantis hypothesis, which Plato uh, first introduced, and overall, I could probably be characterized as a Platonist, and uh, of course, so could Schopenhauer. So I'm a big fan of Schopenhauer. He's one of the first philosophers I really got into, so I am looking forward to this discussion. Thanks for having me on. And finally, Tom. So yeah, not much of an introduction from me. I just have this very like intimate love of Schopenhauer in philosophy. Um, my background is really uh, journalism, oddly enough, but... Uh, I studied uh, political theory at university and history, and Schopenhauer for me has just been a kind of lifelong love, really. And that's I'm just kind of amateur at this, I suppose. Um, but I've written, you know, a lot of stuff on him. Yeah, your Twitter account is well worth following as well for anyone that's interested in this stuff. Um, and yeah, I share. I mean, there's uh, some people just seem especially drawn to Schopenhauer. I mean, the first philosopher I read was uh, Nietzsche. And then I sort of went back to ancients and to, you know, the philosophers everyone reads, but overlooked Schopenhauer for quite a while because I had a, so I said I'm pigeonholed like a lot of people do as the guy that was a pessimist, a nihilist. He's always presented as, um, you know, just an ethicist or, you know, someone that was uh, generally blackpilled on the state of things. But I don't think he's ever presented with the seriousness that he deserves in terms of how comprehensive his metaphysics was. Um, far more comprehensive than Nietzsche, for example. Uh, so when I finally did find him, um, yeah, it was quite a revelation, and I sort of devoured his work, read everything he wrote. And since then, I found myself going back again and again to Schopenhauer, but I still feel he doesn't uh, at all get the recognition or credit or is treated with the seriousness that he deserves. So it's good to be able to put together a discussion like this. So getting on to Schopenhauer, um, I don't normally like to do too much biographical background uh, when discussing philosophers. I tend to skip over those sections of uh, any philosophy books, but I guess he had a, a quite uneventful life. He was born in Danzig. Um, he was not a university lecturer. He uh, lived off a modest inheritance from his father. Uh, he did at one time actually host lectures on the same day as Hegel, who he detested, um, but everyone went to the Hegel lectures, um, which really ticked off Schopenhauer to no end and throughout his life he uh, wrote with great bitterness against uh, Hegel and Schelling and uh, other philosophers of his day. Um, he never really got the recognition that he deserved. Uh, his work was largely unnoticed until the end of his life when uh, his collection of essays got some recognition and uh, supposedly he was quite thrilled about the uh, minor fame he had in later life and he would even uh, collect uh, mentions of himself from newspapers around Europe. There are some quite funny anecdotes about Schopenhauer. You know, his personality does seem to be uh, 
a reflection of, of his philosophy. Like there's, you know, one of the, the well-known stories is that he, he spent a, a lot of his life paying damages basically to an old lady who he had thrown down the stairs outside his apartment because she was conversing too loudly. And uh, he wrote a lot about his, his annoyance of, of noise and um, obviously was, was quite short-tempered in that regard as well. In terms of his philosophy, uh, I just have some notes here. Uh, Schopenhauer crafted one of the most comprehensive philosophical systems the world has ever seen. He weaved together ideas of Plato, Kant, and Asian religions into an encyclopedic worldview that combines the empirical science of his day with mystic wisdom in a radically idealist metaphysics and epistemology. So the fundamental distinction in Schopenhauer's philosophy is a dualistic conception of the world as representation, that is, as it appears to thought, and as the thing in itself uh, considered independently of all concepts and categories of mind. And Schopenhauer identifies the thing in itself as will, which he further characterizes as blind urging or uncaused, unmotivated, objectless and subjectless striving or desire. This discovery and its implications have earned Schopenhauer a unique but often misunderstood place in the history of philosophy. The basis for all of Schopenhauer's system is his theory of knowledge, which he refers to as the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason. The principle divides explanations for any occurrence in the world as representation into four types of generalizations, uh, including all logical, mathematical, causal, moral, or even motivational phenomena. The fourfold root thereby serves as a criterion demarcating the limits of possible explanation, distinguishing between the represented world for which any object or event in principle is capable of being explained and the thing in itself, which cannot be explained at all by any part of the principle. Schopenhauer's epistemology and idealist metaphysics underwrites a doctrine of moral pessimism for which arguably he's best known with a unique perspective on the traditional problems of ethics, aesthetics, and a reinterpretation of the perennial quest for freedom, salvation, and immortality that are distinctively Schopenhauerian. So, as I said, Schopenhauer's uh, main debts are to Plato, Kant, and later um, the ancient religions of India, though uh, he only discovered those after he published his major work, uh, The World as Will and Representation. And uh, supposedly he was quite overjoyed to find that the conclusions he'd come to in his main work had already been come to um, by the Buddha, um, by the authors of the Vedas, of the Upanishads. And that great, gave him great comfort in, in later life. And I think if he was around today, he would be recognized as uh, what we might call a, a non-dual thinker or a, you know, a thinker in the lineage of Advaita Vedanta. But before that, his two major influences and who he was, uh, I believe when he started university, he was told by his tutor to focus uh, almost exclusively on Kant and Plato. And he wouldn't go far wrong if he did that. Uh, that turned out to be quite good advice because really, those are the two thinkers that he owes the greatest debt to. He references them again and again in his major work. But really, I think to understand uh, Schopenhauer's philosophy, a necessary starting point is to understand the Kantian basis for it. And Kant's major contribution is the creation of what he calls transcendental idealism uh, versus the uh, subjective or empirical idealism of people like Berkeley who had come before him. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it on to Ryan. And could you just give um, a brief sketch on Kant's major contribution and why this is so influential on where Schopenhauer starts from? Definitely. So Immanuel Kant, German philosopher, he was born in 1724, died in 1804. His major contribution to philosophy and his most well-known contribution to philosophy is his critique of pure reason which is essentially a, a critical analysis of past metaphysical systems and how any kind of future metaphysical inquiry must be curbed to some extent to conform with certain a priori principles or forms of intuition which are necessary for any kind of knowledge of the empirical world whatsoever. So Kant begins his famous work with uh, some pretty important questions, such as how is synthetic a priori knowledge possible of propositions such as 7 plus 5 equals 12? Um, 
now this is a bit technical, but synthetic propositions are um, propositions wherein the uh, predicate is not contained within the subject of the proposition, and analytic propositions are ones wherein the subject is contained in the predicate. Um, essentially, this important technical problem outlines the entirety of Kant's uh, system and what he does to try to uh, allow for such knowledge to be possible. Now, he's coming from a very um, important clash of traditions, essentially. So he was raised in the Leibnizian, the Wolfian tradition of rationalism, essentially, which is very intellect uh, intellectualistic. It's um, very interested in uh, a priori deductions, uh, an attempt to grasp nature as a whole through uh, purely rationalistic means. And this contrasts with the um, uh, empiricists such as Locke and Berkeley, uh, who were very uh, sensualistic in a sense, uh, focusing heavily on empirical information and gathering our knowledge from the empirical world itself. Now, Leibniz, or sorry, Kant, sorry, he uh, was very uh, adamant about a rationalistic view of things until he came across the writings of David Hume, uh, a famous empiricist, uh, skeptic, and his readings of Hume essentially drove him out of what he called a dogmatic slumber. And it caused a bit of a panic in him, <laughs> and he tried to figure out how we can avoid such destructive skepticism, while at the same time trying to uh, be able to have some kind of interaction with the world. How are we able to still understand the world with respect to things like causality um, and other um, very important concepts that Hume seemed to have uh, essentially reduced to uh, pure concomitants without any kind of necessity, things like that. So Kant postulates that there are uh, 12 a priori pure concepts or categories which the, my, our minds have. So these being unity, plurality, totality, reality, negation, limitation, substance, cause, community, possibility, existence, and necessity. These a priori forms of understanding or knowledge essentially filter out all of our um, filter throughout our, our entire uh, reasoning process, our entire ability to grasp the world. Everything is filtered through these concepts and we can't really get out of them. Also, what's very important is that space and time for Kant are a priori forms of intuition. So space and time is not outside the head, rather it is inside the head, to use Schopenhauer's language. And this is very important because it creates a kind of bifurcation between our way of knowing things and things as they are in themselves. And this bifurcation essentially leads to uh, a total agnosticism about what things are in themselves. And Kant is, he's a bit inconsistent, but he tries to be silent about what things are in themselves. And Schopenhauer says that we have an idea of what things are in themselves, and this is will. So this kind of leads into uh, Schopenhauer's system as a whole. So this is where it starts from, and this is where it leads. And just one important point is the categories that you mentioned. Um, what the 12 categories of Kant, isn't it? That Schopenhauer Correct. actually boils these down to just three categories, which is space, time, and causation. Correct. And another one of his insights, and this is why he's able to, uh, what he sees as sort of build on Kant's philosophy and to kind of correct Kant's philosophy is uh, Kant talks about things in themselves. Um, and Schopenhauer says that this is a contradiction because, mm -hmm. because space and time are things that we impose on the world, their categories uh, within our minds, um, that there aren't things in themselves because, you know, that separation is something that is uh, idealistic and it's presented to phenomenal consciousness. Mm -hmm. But the 
thing in itself would have to be unitary. Uh, it's outside of space, time, and causality, so it would have to be a unity. So it's redundant to speak about things in themselves. There is one unitary thing in itself, and that's kind of the starting point of Schopenhauer's philosophy. Exactly. But the most important insight is the separation uh, that Kant comes up with between uh, the world as, in, as it is in itself and as it presents to phenomenal consciousness. And this is the uh, division between uh, the world as representation and the thing in itself, which Schopenhauer would later identify as will. Uh, so we see here the important sort of Kantian starting point uh, for Schopenhauer's metaphysics. And he really sees himself as being the only one that is properly loyal to Kant in the uh, German idealist tradition. You know, he sees Hegel and, and Schelling and Fichte as uh, kind of abandoning the insights of Kant and going back to uh, the kind of speculative rationalism of people like Leibniz, uh, whereas he sees that he is he's taken uh, Kant's philosophy to uh, its logical conclusion. Um, so that's the Kantian influence. Another influence that you'll see mentioned a lot uh, in The World as Will and Representation, Schopenhauer's major work, is uh, a work, he references earlier work a lot, The Fourfold Root of the Principle of Sufficient Reason. This is actually his doctoral thesis. Uh, I think he wrote it when he was only 25. Um, and Erval, would you like to just give a, a brief background on uh, Schopenhauer's conception of the Principle of Sufficient Reason? The Principle of Sufficient Reason, obviously, wasn't anything new. You can see um, philosophers like Spinoza used this a lot in their philosophy, uh, but Schopenhauer has uh, his own understanding of the PSR. Okay, so Schopenhauer identifies the first statement of the PSR as being uh, coined by Leibniz. Other philosophers had noted this general principle, which might be stated as everything has a reason for being what it is and not being what it's not. Leibniz formally states this, but doesn't remain consistent in different senses of the concept of a principle of sufficient reason or a ground. Uh, what often happens is his, the preceding philosophers would conflate the idea of a reason for a uh, judgment, a rational ground of truth, with the cause of an event. And... Uh, so Schopenhauer identifies two broad principles in all thought and credits Plato and Kant as both observing this as well as the principles of homogeneity and specificity. These are like the two extremes of all taxonomic divisions in language. So Schopenhauer recognizes in preceding uses of the concept of the principle of sufficient reason an inadequacy of specification. It's too general, it leads to conflations. His purpose in his doctoral thesis is to clarify the different species of the principle of sufficient reason. And the use of this is so that uh, scientists, philosophers, will be able to state exactly what they mean by a reason without running into these conflationary problems. So the four categories of the principle of sufficient reason are becoming, knowing, being, and willing. He presents them in that order. The PSR of becoming has for its matter the time-space causality nexus of intuitive perceptual reality. Each of these categories of the PSR corresponds to a class of objects for the subject. The subject-object duality is presupposed behind all categories of the principle of sufficient reason, um, but becoming, the PSR of becoming, applies specifically to what Schopenhauer would define as reality. One thing about Schopenhauer is that he was very good with his definitions. When I think of the definitions of various philosophical concepts, like concept, judgment, understanding, reality, truth, I typically think of Schopenhauer's definitions just because they work so well with our, our expectations in language. Schopenhauer also thought that our languages embed philosophical truths, and this is kind of in line with his perspective on individual knowledge. Most of our knowledge is subterranean, it's subconscious. We know things without exactly knowing why, 
And by the same token, collectively, there are things in language that individuals aren't really responsible for. So it's kind of fitting that his definitions work so well with our intuitive concepts of these things. So the principle of sufficient reason of becoming deals with reality, time, space, matter, uh, causality. And he demonstrates that this uh, principle of becoming, this intuitive perceptual reality, must be intellectual. So he demonstrates that this in, this uh, intuitive perception of reality, time, space, causality, must be intellectual. If it wasn't intellectual, then certain facets of our representation of empirical reality would not be possible. Given the nature of our sense awareness uh, with regard to vision, we shouldn't be able to perceive depth since the retina is a flat plane. Um, there must be some kind of inference of the cause of our sensations um, in order to generate depth perception. And he goes through line of sight and different aspects of this in a lot of detail. Another thing about Schopenhauer is he was always interested in uh, current understandings of medicine and kept, kept up on the medical journals. And that comes across in a lot of his writings. Um, but he, he demonstrates that this understanding must be intellectual um, and also that things like the forces of nature and matter, which are the contents of time and space, can't themselves be caused. He identifies matter as basically causality embodied. Matter is the capacity for causation. And forces of nature, he identifies as that which allows for causal processes he actually defines a force of nature in his magnum opus as the same sort of thing that basically we are inside, which on the one hand, most generally is the will in all things. It's the will. But he identifies various grades of the objectification of the will, with man being the highest, highest grade of its objectification and the forces of nature being its lowest grade of objectification. Um, he identifies three empirical types of causation. One is causation in mechanical systems. Another is stimuli, which mostly applies to plants, but we also have uh, an element of our own body which engages in this kind of plant life, uh, plant-like life. Uh, a stimulus is distinguished from a, a pure cause by the unpredictability of the relation between the cause and the effect. With a, an ordinary mechanical cause, if you double the cause, the effect might double or there'll be some kind of consistent ratio. Stimuli, it's difficult to determine predictable uh, ratios between cause and effect. Motives are always mediated by knowledge, and so only animals act according to motive, but a motive for an animal has the same kind of necessary determining quality as causation in mechanical systems. And then he identifies the body as the immediate object of, uh, of representation. And we know our immediate object of representation directly through our inner sense as the state of our will, and then indirectly through our causal inference of our sense data, like us, you know, seeing our body, feeling our body, we infer its existence in the causal nexus in time and space. The next category of the PSR is knowing. And he has a lot of good definitions of different concepts here. So the content of the PSR of knowing uh, is concepts per se. Concepts are always, for Schopenhauer, abstracted from perception. And he criticizes other philosophers for having concepts with no clearly defined ground. He sees that the learning of language, the acquisition of language, trains all the logical rules that logicians identify formally into uh, normal people. And even without understanding all the formal rules of logic, everyone has access to reason by virtue of acquired language. And he would say that people who were uh, deaf and dumb who never learn language are incapable of reason. So reason is the faculty of arranging 
concepts, um, or, or more properly, arranging judgments. And judgment is the faculty that uh, mediates between the understanding and reason. Reason is what we use to arrive at logical truth. Judgment is what we use to subsume individual cases under concepts. So seeing an object in empirical reality and identifying what it is, that's uh, done by the judgment. And then the reverse is also true. So uh, generating a concept from a set of perceptions. Schopenhauer would say that people in general are weak in judgment, but uh, reason has a way of kind of compensating for this because we can take judgments as premises in arguments. So testing uh, the truth of someone's logical statements doesn't just require reason, it also requires judgment, and that's the rub because, like I said, people are not generally uh, good with judgment. Truth is, for Schopenhauer, the reference of a judgment to something else. So a judgment can be grounded by another judgment, in which case the truth is logical, like uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. The truth of the judgment that Socrates is mortal is grounded in these other judgments by the logical relations. Empirical truth is uh, the truth that you get when a judgment is related to empirical reality. It's grounded in empirical reality. There's also transcendental truth, which grounds judgments in our pure intuitions of sensibility and understanding. So the, the identity of the understanding as the a priori faculty of, uh, you know, inference of causation, talking about that faculty requires this kind of transcendental truth. Is how do we know that that judgment is valid? It appeals to our direct intuitions. So judgments which are grounded in pure intuitions of sensibility are synthetic a priori, and such judgments have transcendental truth. Um, again, synthetic a priori judgments are, as uh, pessimistic idealism said, judgments such as 5 plus 7 equals 12. Um, this, we are appealing to our intuitions of space and time. And those intuitions themselves are, are the subject of the next category, the third category of the principle of sufficient reason. Um, the last kind of truth is metalogical truth. These are judgments which have as their ground of truth the formal conditions of all thought. And there are only four of these, uh, which are the principle of identity, the principle of non-contradiction, the principle of the excluded middle, and then the principle of sufficient reason of knowing itself, the idea that every proposition has a ground. Um, so he actually thinks that these metalogical truths were arrived at originally inductively and would argue that actually they can really be boiled down into the law of the excluded middle, that is, A is either A or not A, and the PSR itself. So the third category of the PSR is the PSR of being, and so this is our intuitions of pure uh, sensibility, our, our intuition of space and time proper. The PSR of becoming has to do with empirical reality, which obviously in incorporates space and time with it, but we have in our imagination space and time in their a priori form, not uh, necessarily entangled in the whole causal nexus. Prior to that, we have intuitions of temporal relations, which are pure succession, and then we have intuitions of spatial relations. The grounds of spatial properties or temporal properties are always other spatial properties or temporal properties. So really he anticipates relativity in space and time. Um, so like a good example of this is an equilateral triangle. We can ground the equality of the sides on the equality of the angles or vice versa. We can uh, ground the equality of the angles by the equality of the sides. And the last category of the principle of sufficient reason is the PSR of willing. And this is the subjective side of what he identified in the PSR of becoming as motive operating in animals. But because we have immediate knowledge of the inner sense, 
uh, subjective knowledge of our own states of will, we know the PSR of willing in a more direct way than any other aspect of the PSR. Um, the subject of knowing knows itself as the subject of willing. This knowledge is a, po a posteriori, so as opposed to the intuitions of space and time, which are a priori, we know our own will through direct empirical experience of the inner sense. And the fact that this direct knowledge of our inner sense, our, ourselves as the subject of willing, the fact that it's so well grounded, allows him to build from that and uh, provide a kind of groundwork for these occult qualities like the forces of nature, like causation itself. It's only by appealing to willing that we can really understand what causation or the forces of nature would be in themselves. And that's really the taking off point. That's how he gets to his main idea from his magnum opus. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's kind of difficult to know where to begin because, you know, as I said earlier, it's there are so many doors, there are so many entry points where you can begin and you can kind of start a conversation wherever you poke. Um, but to begin with kind of this idea that, you know, the question of, you know, what do we know? Um, what can we know? And, you know, as, as you've said, Kant said that, you know, the thing in itself is kind of, it cannot enter into knowledge directly. It's, it's something that's kind of beyond us. And we only know the phenomenon. Uh, but Schopenhauer actually sort of amends that by saying that actually there is something we, we do intimately know that we intimately grasp that is kind of immediate. And that is will. That's kind of the, 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 the essential ingredient of being. And that takes philosophy in an interesting direction because it can, you can sort of get bogged down in concepts, but the moment you kind of say that desire, striving, will is what's nearest to you, what is realist about you, um, that, that makes philosophy much more intimate. It's, you know, the, the abstractions are important. You have to conceptualize things. These are kind of rungs on the ladder. But um, this... This is what makes his second volume of the world of will and representation so interesting. You know, he starts off with this, you know, kind of important metaphysical groundwork, um, laying out the concepts, um, you know, laying out the groundwork, which we've kind of gone over already. But in the second volume, he, he kind of turns it into something more intimate. Um, it has a kind of real emotional significance. And it's so typically we, we, we expect philosophy and especially the sciences to explain the material facts of the world, and it's very abstract. But Schopenhauer's philosophy, it explains not only that, it explains the actual phenomenology of uh, being in the world. Um, and in this way, I, I think um, Heidegger doesn't give enough credit uh, to Schopenhauer. I don't think Schopenhauer influenced Heidegger, but um, Schopenhauer does an extremely good job um, of using metaphysics, of using philosophy, to give this kind of subjective character to it. Um, I suppose that kind of ties into the aesthetics um, aspect. Yeah, this is the, you know, this is the turn that Schopenhauer makes that makes his philosophy uh, quite unique in that, you know, he starts out the world as well in representation uh, with the first section, which is a long argument for idealism. Um, you'll often find in the world is willing to representation. He kind of repeats points a lot. He's very careful. Um, he's you know he's very keen to make sure there's there's no misunderstanding, which is why it's kind of amazing how many academics still uh, misinterpret uh, Schopenhauer. Um, but this is his insight where he shifts from idealism, which is merely about the the world as it presents to consciousness as representation, to where we can get at. Like, what is the noumena? What is the thing in itself? Um, because, you know, with Kant, you're left with uh, this kind of agnosticism, but Schopenhauer is keen to get to, uh, you know, to find the, the kernel uh, of the world. And he says that here we already see that we can never get at the inner nature of things from without. However much we may investigate, we obtain nothing but images and names. 
we're like a man who goes around the castle looking in vain for an entrance and sometimes sketching the facades. Yet this is the path that all philosophers before me have followed. Uh, so Schopenhauer, as you say, does this kind of uh, inward turn where we know the world in two ways. We know it as representation, as it presents to our consciousness, you know, from the objective standpoint, that's how, you know, we know other creatures. But then we have this uh, unique perspective where we're also uh, uh, an expression of, of the noumena in the world. And so Schopenhauer's insight is that if we uh, if we look inward, we'll find what the, the nature of the noumena of the thing in itself is. And when we look inward, what we find is constant striving, uh, this blind will to live. And then we can kind of uh, extrapolate that and we can see that uh, through the principium individuationist, the principle of indivi of individuation, um, that this is what the whole world is in, in various forms and expressing itself um, through various forms of, of life and consciousness. Exactly. Um, what's What I found um, very insightful is that since we do have this very, very unique insight into things. So, so he, he kind of says that we kind of come at the world. Yeah. As you were saying, there's this uh, objective world, but at the same time though, we're kind of on the inside of things, so to speak. And language also, it kind of um, helps get at this point when we say like, uh, like the internal world, so to speak, or inside the head, um, like in the mind, things like that. So it kind of, it uh, helps us orient what things are or what seem to be what they're like in themselves. So, for example, what we, what we find when we turn into ourselves, when we gaze inside, we find um, striving, restlessness, um, things that are, uh, yeah, like there's a bit of a disequilibrium, so to speak. We're always striving for something. Knowledge is always driven by will. That's something that's very important for Schopenhauer, the primacy of the will over the intellect. Um, it, it kind of serves as the, uh, um, the, the intellect serves as a tool of the will for Schopenhauer. But the fact that when we view ourselves um, in its most uh, primordial and primitive sense, as striving beings, beings that are motivated um, with, or motivated by subconscious desires, urges, um, very brutish uh, passions, things like that, that are seemingly uh, totally uh, blind, very um, animalistic. Schopenhauer conceives this as a paradigm whereby we can, uh, if you want to say project or infer what the inside of things, so to speak, is like for um, all of the objects, if you want to call it that, what it's like in itself. So to be careful not to say uh, things in themselves, but the thing in itself generally. So he conceives the will as a, a paradigm whereby we can understand what things are like, things are like, or well, what that in itself is like of things. Uh, and that's very yeah. important. And it's, and you could, it's, it would be a strange thing. And I, I think this is the intuition Schopenhauer has. It would be a strange thing if we existed in the world, you know, we had, we were kind of full of this sense of being in the world, but we just took no part in it. We, we, we didn't actually share some essential part of it. And I feel like that's, that's an instinct that, um, you know, philosophers throughout the ages have had and the kind of instinctive idealists, the romanticists. We can't just be this kind of separate thing from the world. We must in some fundamental way share in the world. And, you know, the will is obviously, Schopenhauer's concept of the will is just a, a perfect fit in that regard. And the way in his philosophy that he kind of, draws this broad analogy um, between all things in the world. You know, the, the way he can show, uh, you know, how the will works in the plant and how you, you can see volition play out in everything, even in the inanimate objects. And there's, a, there's a good book on this. Um, he wrote, what's it called? Uh, on the Will in Nature. 
That's another one mm -hmm. of his books, which is very much worth reading. And uh, it just, it kind of fills you with this conviction that this is kind of fundamentally what the world is, is this kind of striving um, aspect. And it's just, it's kind of, you know, a lot of people might, you know, read his metaphysics and say, you know, this is all abstract and um, it's all kind of pie in the sky. But, but that aspect of it is just so obviously true. Um, so I think that it's important to think of it in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, what's important is that it's the only, I'm sorry. I oh, no, you can continue. Oh. What's important about the will as the noumenon is that it's the only way we could understand things like causation, like to think that, to understand what it would be like to be a falling stone, to really understand the falling of the stone. There has to be something in the nature of matter that's the same as that which is within ourselves, or else mm -hmm. it would be totally foreign and alien. Like there has to be some kind of mm -hmm. common ground. Right. And if, if you took the materialist view of matter seriously, I mean, the, the essence of matter would be the opposite of kind of striving and movement. It would be just this perfectly static, stationary, ineffective thing. But that's obviously not the world we inhabit. It's not just these dots that are, you know, kind of positioned in the world. There's, there's a real movement to the world. Yeah, it's purely structural. That. That's what uh, the, the physicists say. There's really, yeah, uh, yeah it, it, we're, um, which is, of course, there's a ton of problems with that. Um, yeah, relations uh, yeah, require some kind of relata of some sort. Otherwise, you get some vicious regresses. But uh, yeah, there is uh, definitely something which underlies it that has to have some commonality between mm. what it's uh, between ourselves in some respect. Otherwise, there there'd be an absolute difference between ourselves and the rest of the world. And this is clearly uh, cannot be the case. Um, cause mm. absolute difference itself presupposes a relation between the two things. So there has to have to be some kind of common. Right. And just the, the, the perfection of analogies, you know, Schopenhauer, um, at one point in the world as will and representation, he, he says that we can think of, um, you know, stretching, um, an elastic band. I don't think he says an elastic band, but, you know, stretching a string of some kind. And that is perfectly analogous to courage in the sense that you're refusing to yield. You're kind of kind of s staying true to yourself. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's quite an important point in this philosophy as well. It's just the, the kind of the perfect adequacy of analogies shows that there's a, a basic unity in the world. And this also comes into being with um, respect to the platonic ideas of things. So this is something that's very interesting. Um, Schopenhauer, he agrees with Plato uh, in the sense that each objectification, so th this is important, so the world as it appears to us is an objectification of the will. So by objectification, that just simply means um, the, the being of the world for us, what is given in presentation or representation or in um, phenomenal consciousness. Now, when we speak of um, like an organism, like a, a plant, let's say, um, that plant is a kind of um, uh, facsimile or copy of what Schopenhauer would call um, the platonic or a platonic idea, essentially. So the ideas of things, and this is something that we have access to in art, um, the uh, um, aesthetic experience. And we see, yeah, as was said before, there's an infinite degree of, um, or like a pyramid of sorts, of different stages of objectification. So st starting at the very, very lowest levels, we have um, the fundamental forces. So for Schopenhauer, he would say like gravity and like electromagnetism for him. Um, and then that moves up through uh, unorganized matter, such as minerals, uh, rocks, and um, even at those fundamental levels there, there's still this um, will, essentially. So when we think of gravity, or like a falling body, let's say, we analogize that with our own um, inner life. When you think about it like a, uh, something 
like a force. Well, wh where do we get this idea of a force from? Well, usually uh, it would be from our overcoming resistance to something. So a subjective experience. That's where we, where we abstract the notion of force from, like um, resistance of, of sorts. And as I was saying, so it moves up through unorganized matter to organized uh, organic matter, such as human beings, well, that's the highest, but like plants, animals, um, insects, things like that. And yeah, culminating at the apex, uh, being the human being. Um, and we have access to the, the archetypes of each grade of the will in art. And this is uh, a very, um, his, his aesthetic theory, um, it's well-respected, especially with respect to music, um, where we also see uh, the ideas, so to speak. And that's a whole other story too, though, because he, he views music as something which is not merely um, an objective in the sense of having like a, a phenomenal reality, but it's itself a, a metaphysical fact that is very um, right. peculiar. Right. And that, yeah, I mean, music, it's again, one of those parts of his philosophy, which like, really kind of vindicates him. Um, you know, you can kind of go through the abstract elements of his philosophy, but then, uh, you know, you, you read his theory on music and it's just a, a perfect description of what music is and what it actually feels like. Um, there's a great video of this uh, on YouTube. This guy called uh, Philosophy Cuck. Philosophy. Cuck. Yeah, Cuck, Cuck Philosophy. philosophy yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, he does this um, video um, demonstrating kind of Schopenhauer's theory of music. And it's just, I, I mean, you can't really dispute that. I mean, once you understand it, it's just an obviously correct account of music. And yeah, just kind of um, his, his the sort of platonic aspect of his philosophy is more difficult. And I wonder sometimes if it's useful to kind of use the term platonic um, because it's, it's quite a big bridge between him <laughs> and Plato, you know, right. 2000 years separate them or something like that. 2300 or whatever, whatever it is. Well, They're using very different vocabularies. Plato has his own style of philosophy. Um, they both agree fundamentally that idea um, precedes matter, so to speak. Um, but I, I think when it comes to his, the aesthetic aspect of his philosophy, I think Schopenhauer really is in a kind of uh, a league of his own, and you have to kind of understand him in his own terms. It's difficult to understand his philosophy of the ideas in his own terms, partly because he, in a way, violates the limits of knowledge which he himself puts down in the principle of sufficient reason. He knows that there must be something to account for the univer universality of the different species in nature. They have to have something in common. His view of the concept is that we abstract it from each of these individual perceptual objects. But why were those perceptual objects similar in the first place? What did they really have in common? There's no way that he gives in his account of the principle of sufficient reason, which is supposed to govern all relational aspects of phenomenology. There's nothing he gives there that would account for our ability to grasp what he calls here the adequate objectification mm -hmm. of will. That is the species itself, the idea in itself. Um, each individual representation is one-sided in one way or another. We only get profiles of things. We don't see the essence of them. We see the, a, a man live one life, not the essence of the man, the character of a man unfold in itself in all possible ways. Mm -hmm. um, but there must be some kind of unity underlying that. The way that Schopenhauer claims that we come to know these, uh, these ideas is by an elevation away from the principle of sufficient reason back to its most general form. Remember, the, the most primitive instantiation of the principle of sufficient reason is the subject-object relation. Mm -hmm. And by withdrawing from individual objects and our, our, our volitional attachment to them, we reduce that aspect of our subject, which is the subject of willing. Mm 
So by reducing away the subject of willing in ourselves, we become the pure subject of knowledge. And it's in this kind of elevated state that we have detached enjoyment of nature and also objects of art. And he makes it very clear what artists are seeking to represent. And it, again, co corresponds very well with our common sense understanding of what artists seek to do in literature, in painting, like the portrait is meant to capture the character of the individual. And even though it's just one still image, there's some way that a good portrait can show you holistically who you're dealing with. And of course, that's aided by the fact that physiognomy corresponds to the will, which Schopenhauer, I think, was the first to really identify and give a good ground for. The reason for that being that the immediate objectification of our will is our body. And so you can see character mm -hmm. displayed directly on the face. But other uh, genres of art, even architecture, display the capacities of the material that, that's being used. Um, in stone architecture, it's the interplay of gravity and tension and even the play of light. You can see the, very clearly the capacities of these basic forces. And that brings out, because it, you're kind of getting a many-sided, very condensed illustration of the nature of these things through a well-constructed building, it brings out the idea of these things. Or the way that we look mm. at a, a flowing stream, the water displays more of its possible modes of action. It displays more of its energies, in other words. And so we can, in, in a way, intuit the essence of water when we're in that kind of detached moment appreciating the babbling brook or whatnot. Um, yeah, and music, yeah, I think he, he says, is not a representation of species of objects, but it is the one form of art which is a direct representation of the will itself. So our, in, our inner sense of our immediate obje objectification, that is our sense given a posteriori of our own will, that is the subject matter of music. That's what's translated in music for Schopenhauer. Yeah, I think it's it's important to um, talk about his understanding of aesthetics in relation to his account of the will. So, I mean, you know, where we left off when we were talking about the will uh, obviously leads him to a quite pessimistic conclusion in that, um, you know, satisfying the will uh, isn't really possible. The will is the final uh, thing in itself. We can derive the will from, uh, we can look at individual acts of willing, but the will isn't willing towards anything. Um, the will is what's there when we strip away every individual act of willing. And um, because it's outside of the principle of sufficient reason, uh, you know, there's no account of the will. It's not willing towards something. Uh, it is this blind striving will. But, um, you know, you could be left with, you know, people focus on um, the pessimistic conclusions of Schopenhauer, but there are means of redemption for Schopenhauer, mm -hmm. which I guess you could broadly break down into um, asceticism is obviously uh, what he focuses on. And uh, this is where he looks towards uh, mystics as people that have sort of denied the will to live and turned it against itself. Compassion uh, is another way outside of this because you know, by living compassion, you're seen beyond the principle of individuation and you're seeing uh, that all expressions of life are, are ultimately the expression of uh, one consciousness that, you know, Schopenhauer writes that, uh, you know, the eye that each being sees through is ultimately the one eye. Um, but then aesthetics takes on this really important role because it's this ultimate objectification of the will that gives us the possibility of detachment from the will to live. And what's interesting is uh, Schopenhauer puts music uh, ahead of all other art forms, and he really sees it as, as the ultimate art form and the ultimate objectification of the will to live. He, he never really gives a, a very detailed uh, rational argument for why uh, music specifically has this, uh, this place at the top of the hierarchy. Um, but he insists, almost like an article of faith, music isn't the representation of representation, but it's the direct objectification of will. Mm. I think, I mean, we can sort of um, boil this down to, I mean, a simple way of putting it is saying, you know, a lack of investment is kind of the way out. Um, and that that's really the ascetic premise. Mm. Um, so, you know, a kind of 
a kind of ordinary example which everyone can understand is, you know, how do you overcome the troubles of being a teenager? Well, it's just it's growing up and no longer being invested in that kind of thing. You know, you 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 no longer feel invested in social outcomes at that grade. Um, and it's just it's the same in general. Uh, when you, when you're not invested in something, the kind of the world unfolds. You you see the world in a kind of more objective manner. Um, objective in the sense of you know unbiased, untainted. And although this kind of, for most people to, to be told that, uh, you know, that the key to happiness is to have absolutely no investment in the world. Uh, I, th I think most people um, understand that, but it's just incredibly difficult to actually go through with that because it seems like happiness is to be found in the world by participating in it and really being involved on a deep level. But actually, you know, it's, you know, the, What's true of, you know, the adult versus teenagehood is also true of, you know, the ascetic versus the normal adult world in the sense that, you know, you're, you're not going to find happiness by being tangled in the world and really indulging the world to life. Um, but, you know, he, I think he's kind of realistic about it and says that, you know, that this is just, it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, that's why so few people attain to that level. Um, he identifies it's just, it's so in our nature ways. to really. Hmm? He identifies two ways to reach that uh, resignation. The first is by basically what his philosophy accomplishes, which is the understanding of the identical nature of the other. So basically, tatvam asi, thou art that. If you intuit that and internalize it in the way that you perceive, then you see the, the predator attacking the prey is really attacking himself and reality <laughs> reveals itself with uh, clarity to be this kind of uh, monstrous thing. And so your will just shrinks from it in virtue of that knowledge. The other way to attain to resignation is just by immense suffering, dealing with immense suffering and um, rather than shirking from it, in wanting pleasure like he he sees the main reason for suicide as basically being the attachment of the will to uh to pleasure and the fear of pain so great enough suffering though can somehow disrupt that tendency of the will to seek greener pastures and uh there's one kind of suicide which he would identify as being a signal of this kind of resignation which is the the suicide of the sannyasi in in India, meditating without uh, taking any any repast. So starvation, voluntary starvation, would be the only kind of noble suicide, and that's characterized. Or I think it's influential that um, Schopenhauer's father committed suicide when he was seventeen, and you can see in Schopenhauer's writing him kind of recon reconciling himself to the meaning of his father's suicide. And he would say that most suicides, it's shrinking from pain. But when you let the suffering really sink in and signify the deeper nature of reality, then this kind of resignation is, is one possible response. But again, it's very rare. He also kind of outlines, outlines the theory of the three gunas in Hinduism and draws an analogy to it um, by virtue of the basic mechanics of the will that he identifies. So a very active will that successfully and rapidly accomplishes its objects would be uh, the Rajas Guna, which is the, the active Guna in Hinduism, the uh, pure subject of knowledge unattached to willing would be the uh, Sattva Guna, and the ennui of slow, lethargic, gradual satisfaction, if any, of the will would be the Tamas Guna. Uh, and so he, yeah, and he rationalizes also... he rationalizes the Hindu concept of salvation um, faithfully and in a way uh, apparently uh, un, uninfluenced by the, the thinking of Advaita Vedanta itself. Right. You can also see the Eastern character of his thought following on from what you mentioned there. Uh, when I talked about earlier, you know, the means of uh, sort of overcoming or denying the will to live, uh, you know, compassion aesthetic enjoyment uh renunciation asceticism and uh the one i didn't mention yeah philosophy and truth and understanding and it, it kind of corresponds to 
you know the three yogas in hinduism that there is a uh, bhakti yoga jnana yoga and uh, karma yoga uh, bhakti yoga is like the yoga of love compassion so this would be you know schopenhauer's idea that compassion is the ultimate basis for morality and it's the it's a means by which we can see beyond the the principle of individuation and uh, kind of abstract and objectify the will um it kind of takes ourselves out of the you know the ego consciousness that the will to live uh sort of traps us in um then karma yoga is a kind of asceticism uh you know it's the the heroic ideal that uh you should sort of um you know you should work and you should uh uh, be duty bound but you should uh, give all of the effects of it up to god and you shouldn't be invested in the outcome in terms of uh, you know your personal egoic self so again that's a kind of um ascetics approach uh, to salvation and then uh, janana yoga is the yoga of knowledge the idea that you know true understanding the underlying uh, unitary nature of reality uh, true seeing beyond the principle of individuation on an intellectual level uh, that one can come to uh, self-realization and salvation so again you see that kind of eastern character in his thought where the means that he's derived through his own philosophy that one can achieve salvation in this life does actually correspond to more religious notions in the east of how that's done mm. i'd also add to that though um he actually identifies compassion as a kind of intellectual triumph as an intellectual superiority it's it's you know when you when we look at a child and we say oh you know that's cute that's actually a kind of intellectual superiority or when we look at a you know a squirrel or something like that we can kind of see the sort of the helplessness of their situation um just kind of how constrained and confined they are by the limitations of their own mind and that kind of brings about a sort of sympathy and so it, it's not just kind of this weakness. It's not this sort of, oh, the world is, uh, you know, so awful and, oh, I wish everything was just okay. I mean, it's it's really identifying that, you know, the, 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 to ignore someone's suffering is to kind of ignore their essence in a way. You're sort of pretending that they're just an object that can take it, which is actually just a kind of bland materialist view. It's just looking at the surface of things. But to actually have the sort of... Um, the kind of extra intellectual spark, which can see in a person that, that, you know, that they're kind of suffering or they're trying their best and they're kind of failing. Uh, that's actually um, a real kind of aesthetic intellectual superiority. And that's why, um, you know, tragedy is such a high art form because it really recognizes the, the tragedy inherent to existence. So it's, uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of, especially critics of Christianity, they, they think it's just a kind of a complete resignation, a complete weakness um, and that, you know, strength entails just ignoring suffering and just powering on regardless. Um, Schopenhauer doesn't see it that way. It's, it's, it's a real kind of intellectual quality. And therefore, you know, geniuses for the most part, he says, uh, are actually um, ethical people as well. Yeah, the, the brief accounts he gives of Christianity and, and some of his essays are quite interesting. Actually, I was thinking about that the other day. He talks about how he calls them the the Jewish religions of monotheism, that they that they, they represent a kind of affirmation of the, that Judaism in its essence represents a kind of affirmation of the will to live. And he, here he make, he makes a split also between like uh, Greek philosophy and Eastern philosophy that the the purpose uh, of philosophy is uh, you know to to live virtuously and happiness, um, and then in Judaism it's to live according to to the law. Whereas the, there's this Eastern character of, of philosophy, which is towards renunciation uh, and salvation and the denial of the will to live. And so he'd see, he, he makes this uh, interesting uh, split between the Old Testament and the New Testament, where he says that the, the New Testament is, is where uh, it goes from the affirmation of the will to live to the denial of the will to live. And it's this entry of this sort of Eastern insight into, uh, into Judaism. Uh, so he does, right. I think he, he places Christianity above uh, the other monotheistic religions in that sense. And even as a passage where he compares like a, a Greek account of a funeral versus the, the Christian uh, funeral with the, uh, you know, the cross and um, everyone wearing black clothes and so on. And, and he says that, the, you know, these are two approaches to death, which is the affirmation of the will to live 
uh, in the, the Greek account of things versus the denial of the will to live in the Christian account of things, which is where you get um, a focus on, on salvation uh, rather than happiness in this life. With, right. um, and you can right. see this I don't of, think it's... Oh, yeah. Yeah, continue. You can see his uh, sort of perennialist take on religion, again, fitting into his overall emphasis on the subconscious action of the will in formulating our understanding of the world. He doesn't really seem to care that the saints of Christianity believed in certain historical doctrines that he might disagree with. He sees the ethical conduct of the saints as basically a kind of subconscious acting out of this deep wisdom that's present in all of us at some level, uh, or perhaps only in the higher types of us. But it doesn't matter what doctrine gets you there. He's kind of indifferent. And as far as the role of philosophy, he doesn't really think that philosophy properly speaking, can get you to that point of, of resignation. You can definitely see that Schopenhauer does have a respect for Christianity, and it's not just that it ties into the Eastern traditions. I think the overarching me message is the vast majority of mankind has always known these truths at some level, and they're common sense truths, like, okay, the, the will is essentially striving. To will something is to not be satisfied, and the recognition that our own private gain comes at the expense of others and that ultimately there's some kind of identity with the other that's given in intuitive uh faculties like mm -hmm. empathy like compassion um so yeah i believe he says that christianity has indian blood in its veins, its veins yeah right yeah but at one point just speaking on the perennialist character uh, there's also a quote from him where he said that my own teaching uh the teaching of buddha and the teaching of Eckhart are the same. Eckhart being Meister, Eckhart the mm. German Christian mystic. So he definitely sees, uh, he definitely recognizes that there's a, a perennial teaching that's running through the Christian mystics, the early church fathers, and the, the Eastern religions that he found in later life. What's very important is, um, so one of his arguments uh, that he gives uh, with respect to idealism, believe it or not, is an ethical one that has to do with the nature of, uh, well, the identity between each other, uh, between myself and yourself and um, ourselves and animals and things like that. So space and time being only uh, a priori forms of intuition that govern uh, the phenomenal world. It essentially, um, when we recognize this fact, we do see that there is an underlying unity. So I am, uh, yeah, tvat tvam asi. So, thou art that, um, there is this identity between myself and the other, self and uh, other, that is very, very important for his theory of ethics and morality. But um, with respect to examples, there's a, a really um, uh, a good one that it's, it's pretty brief, so I think it might be good to just uh, give an example from uh, the world is willing representation. So it, it goes something like this. The approach of death and hopelessness, however, are not absolutely necessary for such a purification through suffering. Even without them, the knowledge of the contradiction of the will to live with itself can, through great misfortune and suffering, violently force itself on us, and the vanity of all endeavor can be perceived. Hence, men who have led a very adventurous life under the pressure of passions, men such as kings, heroes, or adventurers, had, have often been seen suddenly to change, resort to resignation and penance, and become hermits and monks. To this class belong all genuine accounts of conversion. For instance, that of Raymond Lully, who had long wooed a beautiful woman, was at last admitted to her chamber, and was looking forward to the fulfillment of all his desires, when, opening her dress, she showed him her bosom, terribly eaten away with cancer. From that moment, as if he had looked into hell, he was converted. Leaving the court of the king of Majorca, he went into the wilderness to do penance. This is an, one of many, many examples that Schopenhauer provides in his writing of these sudden, whoops, sudden uh, conversions, essentially, the sudden realization of the, the horror of the will to live and what it leads us to do.
there's um, a very, uh, yeah, it's very pessimistic. But at the same time, though, there is that, that possibility of salvation that Schopenhauer emphasizes, especially with respect to suicide. So he mm. says that suicide is, is just another affirmation of the will to live, essentially, because it's not that um, you want it, uh, you're dissatisfied with your present state of, um, of, of being, basically, and you would will another state. So, and you, you do that through the act of suicide itself. So he, he criticizes that. So, I mean, essentially, I think another important point we need to make is, and you, you, you said this at the beginning, Keith, a lot of people take him to be just this cynic uh, who offers no solutions. He's just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just honest. And a kind of, it's a kind of pleasant honesty. You know, we like to complain about the world, but it's, it's not just that. He's not just saying this world sucks, uh, you know, full stop. There is this salvation element because ultimately suffering is negative, he says. And, you know, this is something that's obviously true. It's uh, all suffering is you are striving to achieve something and you're being denied that outcome. Your you're striving is kind of being met with resistance. And happiness is kind of when that resistance is not there and you kind of you're striving kind of goes forward unhindered. That's what he says pleasure is. And to be denied that is suffering. Um, and of course, you can kind of just take a shortcut through that by not striving in the first place. And that, that's kind of the, the wisdom of the, of the ascetic lifestyle. Um, because if you don't strive in the first place, you've already kind of got that base level of happiness. So he's, happiness isn't this kind of, and this is a really important point. It's quite difficult to articulate, but happiness isn't this, you don't start from zero and then happiness is added on, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like as a, as a positive addition to zero. Rather, you begin suffering by striving. You start at negative one and happiness is getting to zero. It's when you stop suffering. It's when your desires have been kind of placated. It's once they've been ended. And so actually the kind of happiness is achieved by not striving in the first place. Um, and salvation consists in realizing that fact by really eliminating your desires as fully as possible and achieving this serene indifference. And this serene indifference, in fact, is something akin to the notion of nirvana. And in that sense, it's kind of the original state of existence. Will is kind of pushing away from that. It's kind of this, it's kind of building this world of differentiation. It's kind of striving and kind of beating with each other as it goes down. But the original state of existence is this kind of serene, indifferent nirvana, which doesn't strive in this direction or that direction, but just is. And that's a very strong link between Schopenhauer and Buddhism. And both have the same view of what salvation looks like. And that, that really is a real happiness. It's not some kind of weak consolation. A true kind of thorough happiness in this world is to not strive in the first place. Um, but it's, it's, it's so difficult to implement in your life and nobody does it perfectly. In fact, just, just, you know, as you said earlier, merely eating, merely, you know, continuing to eat, getting hung, hungry in the evening and eating, that is an affirmation of the will. So very few of us can do this. But if you could, theoretically, if you were the perfect Buddha, um, that that would be the sort of salvation. Um, I, I think that's an important point to emphasize. Right. Yeah, I think it's it's important to emphasize. I mean, people talk about, you know, again, this happens with every philosopher to a degree. You know, you get the the sort of pop philosopher view of things with like uh, things like the school of life and philosophy popularizers and stuff. But Schopenhauer's pessimism is presented as this kind of subjective judgment on the world that you know, he just looked on the world and he, he saw a lot of suffering and it was, it was too much for him. And he, he made these sort of ethical pronouncements. And even Bertrand Russell, when he covers Schopenhauer in his, his big text on the history of Western philosophy, he just glances over this in a sentence. He says that it's as irrational to say that, um, it's as irrational to conclude a, a pessimistic conclusion about the nature of the world than it is to conclude an absolutely optimistic one like Leibniz and he just kind of passed it over like that but people don't grapple that his pessimism is rooted in his metaphysic and the concept of the will that anything that we identify as happiness that it actually isn't this 
it's not this on off switch between pleasure and pain where the two things are sort of finally balanced as you say it starts at a negative and that ultimately anything that we actually identify as happiness is ultimately just a temporary cessation of the will so the pleasure the pleasurable experience of eating food is pleasurable because it's the the cessation of hunger uh, that's the most obvious example and even if we look at you know what may be a, a temporary a uh, very pleasurable period for humankind that ultimately rests on uh, great suffering for other objectifications of the will and he often uses the example of you know look at the picture of um one objectification of the will the vow and another look at uh you know a, a lion eating a gazelle or whatever that the the pleasure experienced by the the lion's cessation of hunger is is pleasure of of eating that animal uh, the suffering of the animal being eaten is always far greater than the the pleasure of the predator and the, you know the pleasure itself is just the the temporary cessation of uh of the feeling of hunger and he, you know he also emphasizes the the fact of boredom that even when we come into a state where all of our needs are satisfied where we're we, you know we're not hungry we're not looking for sex all of these things are satisfied we're in a, a perfectly sort of pleasurable experience the kind of you know the perfect sort of pleasure machine that the utilitarians might imagine for us that what fills the void is is boredom and and on we and he even says in some of his his essays on pessimism that you know boredom itself is proof um that human life is 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 ultimately purposeless and meaningless you know the famous quote that life swings like a pendulum between pain and boredom that even when we satisfy uh, our will and even when we uh, experience what should be happiness uh, it's immediately filled um by boredom uh, so there, there mm. there's never an ultimate happiness in in satisfying willing and that, that's the basis for the pessimism it's not just that he's especially perturbed yeah. by the suffering he sees in life it's not just that he's uh, an especially depressive kind of person he's deriving this from the nature of the thing in itself the nature of the world right. there's a and fundamental i think another yeah. i was going to say another um kind of difficulty Schopenhauer has is that his philosophy just isn't a good topic of conversation in everyday life i mean we've set up this conversation it's quite a serious conversation we've come at this quite formally um but you know other kinds of philosophies you know nietzsche i've actually spoken many times in a pub about nietzsche you can talk very easily about nietzsche um but someone like schopenhauer i mean it's a bit of a mood killer right so it's as i said before it's it's a very intimate philosophy and it's it's one of those things where you kind of you read it by yourself you come to terms with it by yourself and it's quite i i actually thought before doing this uh podcast it might be quite uh difficult to discuss it in a, in a kind of group way i mean it's turned out good but it it is that's one of the problems he suffers from it's 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 difficult to kind of bring his philosophy out into the air you know he shouldn't be surprised or he should not have been surprised by the fact that this uh long work criticizing the world criticizing the will criticizing human nature as evil wasn't immediately very well received like this world that i'm calling evil is not appreciating what i'm saying um it's yeah it's pretty clear before we wrapped up i did want to um kind of compare not just to buddhism but to platonism you know schopenhauer was a scholar of plato and the other aspect of this kind of pessimism is more the platonic side of things so in the same way that any given object of empirical perception is in an inadequate representation of its inner essence or capacities you know it's only a one-sided view any object of desire we're getting a limited and ephemeral uh solution to a temporary movement of will and so obviously there can't be any lasting satisfaction in that a, a grade higher than satisfaction in material objects empirical perceptions is the kind of detached identification with the absolute subject of knowledge that happens in aesthetic experience and art and basically what you're seeing here is the same kind of succession of orders of being that's present in platonism and it's actually exactly parallel so with schopenhauer the ultimate being of reality is the will in itself which is fundamentally one in in platonism esoteric platonism there is the one for Schopenhauer the will is one for Platonism the one is the the summit of being 
And beneath the level of the one in Platonism, we have the intellectual essences, or what uh, Schopenhauer would also agree are the platonic ideas. These are undifferentiated in space and time. They are the adequate objectifications of will. And there's some measure of pleasure that we can get from this. We can kind of participate of that higher pleasure of the intellectual essences, the, the forms in themselves in their own nature. We have access to those things. In our own uh, existence, we are souls. We have an intelligible character which really is the same species of beings as those forms. It's the grades of the objectification of will. The simpler ones are purely ideal. The immediate objectification of our own will is our character, our personality in life. That We can have a, a knowledge of that and we can know other people's characters and again kind of escape the immediate um, immediacy of ephemeral desires on the day-to-day -day basis. And then beneath that is the material world, again, in Platonism. The one, the intellectual essence is souls and then matter. And in Platonism, everything is suspended from the orders above. In Schopenhauer's philosophy, we have the will, the ideas, the intelligible characters, so our souls. And then our souls produce, through our understanding, the causal nexus in time and space. And the only goods that we can experience are ultimately the goods that are suspended from that, that uh, the inner nature of things in themselves. So constantly chasing after objects of matter is, is looking away from the source of being. He characterizes uh, the final resignation and you know, cessation of phenomenal reality as a kind of nothing, but he's he's basically just agnostic about what that experience would look like. In a way, Schopenhauer doesn't go perhaps far enough, whereas the later Platonists envisioned a kind of continual rise through different orders of being, like you could actually experience the realm of forms. Um, Schopenhauer doesn't speculate on the existence of any higher beings, where, like demiurges or anything like that, or at least not openly. There is perhaps an esoteric dimension to Schopenhauer's philosophy. He was very well read in, in all of the intellectual currents of his day, had a big influence on them as well. Uh, but, but yeah, that, there is that parallel between Platonism and Schopenhauer's philosophy, uh, just as there is between Platonism and Hinduism in the first place. One um, interesting fact that I think is pretty important uh, with respect to his concept of the will and the relation between that and um, salvation, as well as aesthetics. So there's a threefold uh, thing going on here. There's a paradox that he addresses. In one respect, salvation cannot be attained through any kind of motivation whatsoever. Uh, so you can't will to be saved, essentially. You, you can't, um, the intellect being the tool of the will, all conceptual matters, things like that, it's all governed and dominated by the will. Yeah, and the same thing is true with all motives. You can't save yourself by proceeding to uh, go about elevating yourself out of this um, will-dominated world of phenomena. You can't uh, vanquish the will inside of you by wanting to do it, so to speak. It has to come naturally. And this is something which he says, as, as we said before, can be done through as the uh, aesthetic experience or um, profound suffering or some kind of radical transformation that happens in an instant, um, like seeing the contradiction of uh, the will, essentially, how it's um, always a, uh, a devouring itself, so to speak. And at the same time, as we were saying with um, aesthetics, one thing that's very important is that it's non-conceptual. All true works of art for Schopenhauer he says, are non-conceptual. And the artist 
who uh, crafts them should not proceed in a uh, conceptual way. So he says, uh, mm. um, I, I have it written here. So Schopenhauer emphasizes that the act of aesthetic appreciation in the act of an aesthetic appreciation, an individual transforms into a pure willless subject and being released from his own selfhood is free from personal interests, cravings, desires, and wants. He is liberated from the pangs of his own individual will. And as we said before, he becomes um, one with that eternal world I. Um, but yeah, these platonic ideas, they're not concepts for Schopenhauer and they're not accessed in, a, in an intellectualistic way. They are, um, as he says, uh, on the contrary, conceptual knowledge as a rule remains always subordinate to the service of the will, as indeed it originated for this service and grew, so to speak, to the will as the head to the body. Um, that's pretty important for him, but uh, mm. it's uh, the knowledge of the Platonic ideas for him in aesthetic experience is a form of knowledge that is not subordinate to the will. Indeed, is an, it is an ephemeral moment of relief where a knowledge breaks free from its service. Um, now, when we see in like contemporary like museums, and uh, you'll find like especially in like a uh, a modern art section, um, like conceptual art, or, um, things like that, it's very. Um, I mean, it's conceptually driven. <laughs> it's about the concept as opposed to what Schopenhauer views as the. The, the true essence of art. Um, the, uh, he, he actually says here, uh, when speaking of the artist, um, if raised by the power of the mind, a man relinqu relinquishes the common way of looking at things, gives up tracing the where, the when, and the why, and the whither of things, and looks simply at the what. If, further, he does not allow abstract thought, the concepts of the reason, to take possession of his consciousness, but instead of all this, gives the whole power of his mind to perception, sinks himself entirely in this, and lets his whole consciousness be filled with the quiet contemplation of the natural object actually present, whether a landscape, a tree, a mountain, a building, or whatever it may be, inasmuch as he loses himself in the object, i.e. forgets even his individuality, his will, and only continues to exist as the pure subject the clear mirror of the object so that it is itself. It is as if the object alone were there without anyone to perceive it. And he can no longer separate the perceiver from the perception, but both have become one because the whole consciousness is filled and occupied with one single sensuous picture. So that's just a bit of an illustration Schopenhauer gives of this uh, process. I was just going to say, uh, it might be good to just briefly uh, explain um, Schopenhauer's theory of genius in relation to that, because uh, you know you say you can't really choose to uh, renounce the will to live, and this is something you see a lot. I saw this in a, a book on Schopenhauer by an analytic philosopher, where he said that it was a, a contradiction that anyone uh, could deny the will to live, or that asceticism uh, could even be possible if Schopenhauer's theory was true. But Schopenhauer kind of covers this in his theory of the genius, where you know, the intellect in general exists to serve the will. You know, we use the intellect in the service of the will to live uh, in contradiction to, you know, what earlier philosophers would have said that, uh, you know, reason dominated and the will was sort of downstream from that. Um, you know, Schopenhauer argues that um, we're more driven by irrational processes, that reason is, is a tool of the will, but that with genius, what you get is an excess of intellect where uh, nature has is, has kind of made a mistake in providing an, an excess of reason uh, such that the intellect can kind of turn on the will and objectify the will and, uh, you know, in the case of, of philosophy, can um, see the irrational processes that are underlying this. Um, you can think of like something like Fisherian runaway in evolution where you know, you have um, these adaptive processes that are driven by the will to live, but you can get this runaway of uh, of sexual selection where you end up having traits that are maladaptive because of uh, uh, females selecting for pronounced traits like larger antlers or horns or something. Uh, the peacock's tail is the clearest example of this. Uh, and you get a sort of an excess of these traits to the point where they become maladaptive. 
And that's kind of how Schopenhauer sees uh, the intellect and the genius. Um, you know, you can maybe mm. look at like evolutionary explanations where, um, you know, the prefrontal cortex sort of uh, potentially evolved to uh, an exaggerated position due to, to warfare and conflict. And it, it gave a, an advantage in this way. Um, but in, in a certain sense, the, the genius is, is maladaptive. It's where there's there's an excess of intellect such that um, such that the intellect can turn on and objectify the will to live. So that kind of corrects, uh, you know, that's a common objection of of people that don't tackle Schopenhauer seriously. Is they say, well, if everything is is will to live, how how could we possibly uh, even think about this objectively, or how could there be asceticism yeah. at all? How could people deny the will to live? Well, it's it's if you just think in your own life, I mean. If you think of just the opposite of genius, you know, call it what you want, the idiot, the stupid person, it's someone who is just kind of, just kind of obviously striving for like some kind of selfish goal. Um, it's, it's, they're, they're biased in some kind of way that they're, they're petty. They're, it's not just that they don't have the brain power. It's, it's that they're petty. They're, they're kind of childish. And, you know, a, a child is kind of in that same position that they're, they're, they're willing more there, there's a predominance of uh, will over you know that kind of slow indifferent intellect and the person who you know the Schopenhauerian genius is someone who just kind of sits back and lets it all unfold and kind of sees it indifferently and you know I, that's kind of almost a Nietzschean point um, Nietzsche is kind of trying to describe that sort of character who doesn't get involved with kind of mass movements and you know, kind of social dynamics. They they sort of have this kind of elongated development where they're they're kind of actually just watching the world for a long time. Um, and so they, that that to me is very uh, intuitive. But um, going back also to what pessimistic idealism said, you know, a young person shouldn't try to be a Schopenhauerian because it it has to be born of real conviction. You know, an old person just is a Schopenhauerian. They, they've actually seen all of life. They've seen the futility of, you know, all effort. And it's just, it's a very natural conclusion to them. Um, you know, they, they haven't kind of picked up the details of Schopenhauer, but they, they have that kind of basic attitude of Schopenhauer. Um, and the only way you can kind of awaken that conviction is to actually live life. It's to live life um, fairly naively, um, live out your hopes and dreams and you know you, you can't kind of you can't kind of desire to be an ascetic it, it does actually have to be sincere uh, I think that's an important warning it always happens through a kind of act of grace in Schopenhauer's language um, at once because there's no knowledge guided by the principle of sufficient reason that leads you to the conclusion that the nature of life is suffering there it, it is this kind of embodying of the pure subject of knowledge where it's disclosed at once and the ch this is the only free act of will in fact that schopenhauer admits other apparent instances of freedom of will are really just kind of an illusion brought up brought on by the fact that we can entertain conceptually various motives and so we see the relative strengths of these motives play out in our consciousness, um, but in that moment when the, the intuitive structure of the body withdraws from acts of will, becomes that pure subject of knowledge, when the, the kind of true character of things is disclosed in a moment, instantaneously the will itself in a way responds freely and that's the only free act that we we have for Schopenhauer to finally let go of this this will and striving, and uh, it's something that's it's hard to to accept that that would be the nature of things. Um, of course, like when we're young, we have objectives in the world, we have things we want to accomplish, but I think you have to look at it like the world is inevitable. Right, space and time are infinite. Everything is already actual. The the apparent differentiation between potential and actual, for for Schopenhauer, is just that it's apparent. You're not going to to eliminate uh, nations or like 
this is ultimately a, a spiritual thing. It's how you relate to the world. And this recognition, um, although, yeah, at heart pessimistic, in a way it can lead to a, a, a freer life, one where you know, you don't have these expectations that finally, if I just accomplish this one thing, then I'll be happy. That's not the structure of the will. That's not, not the structure of our lives. Accepting this kind of slow, gradual toil, that accepting that most moments aren't happy, and that this is borne out by the way that people carry themselves all the time, like walk through a crowd and look at people's faces. It's usually not neutral. It's usually not happy. It's usually slightly unpleasant. That's the resting face of most people. And if you can accept that, then it, then actually you can function as this genius for a nation, genius for a race and accomplish things that, that are more in, in line with like ultimately the interests of, of collective. So it's a kind of paradoxical thing, like a Chinese finger trap perhaps, where once you let go, actually all of those immediate uh, objects of will, the things you want, become easier to reach because you're not hindered by your own striving. Uh, there was a play that was written in response to Schopenhauer's philosophy. Uh, I, I listened to a recording of it, but I forget the, the title, unfortunately. But it was basically on this theme. It was about a young man who internalized this philosophy of pessimism, and suddenly his attitude was kind of carefree and happy because the, the illusion was broken for him that striving after things in the world will actually yield some final satisfaction. If you accept that it won't, then you can sort of move on to more important things like art and you know compassion and the things that uh, we we generally value as as moral things for people. Yeah, I think it's interesting even to look at um, if you look kind of deeper at the way the sort of direct paths to enlightenment in Eastern traditions are explained, and even some of the the twentieth century direct path teachers that. You know, the popular understanding of enlightenment or mysticism is that it's this sort of explosion of of eternal bliss. It's this it's like the ultimate pleasure, you know, this feeling of of oneness and uh unity with God and, and this kind of thing. But uh if you look at it in a very kind of rigid, analytic way, um, the way this process is described, um, you can look at something like uh, if you look at 20th century mystics like Ramana Maharshi or Mahar Nizargadatta Maharaj, they emphasize uh, focusing on what they call the I am, and that anytime there's a feeling of volition or investment in an action, anytime that there's that sort of arising of the egoic consciousness of investment in outcomes, that you bring it back to the I am, you bring it back to the I, which is kind of prior to um, that egoic thought. And the idea is that eventually there's kind of a, a fallen away of the sense of personal doership. This is the same thing in, in Buddhism. And you know what this, you know, this talk of oneness, what it really is, is it's this gradual fallen away of the feeling of personal doership and a gradual detachment where one comes to identify with the awareness of the world that is unfolding, which includes in it, the awareness includes uh, the individual and the individual's thoughts and all of these things. But there's a certain acceptance on a deeper level, or maybe a certain resignation, rather than a constant investment in the willing. So the willing is still there, you know, and, um, you know, there's a Zen koan, like what happens before enlightenment, you know, you chop trees and collect water, and what happens after enlightenment, you chop trees and collect water. Um, so you know the the uh, the the atman, the individual self, is still going to live out its life. It's still going to live according to the will to live. But on that deeper level, there's uh, there's a, a disattachment, and there's a shift in identification uh, away from the volition to that undifferentiated awareness. Right. Beautifully said. Uh, I would just say that I I disagree, perhaps ultimately with Schopenhauer's pessimism, just in the fact that I don't necessarily think this is the extent of things, earth, and I don't know that man is the highest grade of the objectification of will. So for my own part, I entertain the possibility that by ascending to the level of those forms, maybe there's some other kind of experience that's not so will-based that 
or maybe it, it's a kind of will that's in harmony with itself. At times, Schopenhauer kind of intimates at this possibility, kind of treats like the perfect socialist utopia as, as a society in which people act for the greater good. He, I think he he sees that like if there was a, a universal recognition of this philosophy of Tat Tvamasi, then uh, you know, there could be a general improvement of life here. So I'm not I'm not a hundred percent a Schopenhauerian at the end of the day. I think he's he's right in that this world as it is is suffering, no doubt. Like that's pretty obvious. But whether mm. we can change things for the better um, or go to a better place, I I don't know. I may I'm open to that possibility. Yeah, I I I, I kind of agree. I mean, Schopenhauer is right insofar as he's talking about this world. But the the, the real question is, and he doesn't actually have. A definite answer. He does kind of go back and forth um, as to what comes after this life. Um, now, I think near-death experiences are um, a very vivid account of what we might expect when, when we die. And that is that uh, consciousness, which is kind of the antithesis of will, um, which is, you know, the point of his philosophy as well, uh, occupies this kind of non-corporeal perspective it kind of elevates above and this is um the kind of in some ways nirvana it's willless it's pure perception it's just the, the kind of it's everything but the world of matter it's it's kind of occupying that that part of reality which is everything but the investment of being in this world and so it's just this kind of pure consciousness which doesn't have any kind of effect in the material world um, it doesn't kind of strive to live, but it's just this pure kind of consciousness of the world. It's, it's very hard to put into words, but near-death experiences and life reviews uh, are very convincing anecdotes as to what we might expect. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm very convinced of that view. And so I, I'm ultimately not a pessimist. Um, I actually think the consolation of this life is that it, uh, you know, we're not stuck here forever. Would we um, like to turn to his account of consciousness itself? I think because that's something which I think might be uh, pretty um, relevant to today, especially um, with respect to idealism and physicalism and uh, neutral monism. I think it's, it's kind of, it's, it's quite a difficult, it, again, because it's a bit like matching Plato with Schopenhauer, although these same debates um, appear over time. It's just the language we use today, it's, it's quite hard to map that onto Schopenhauer, you know, especially if you're trying to discuss this with an analytic philosopher, they'll insist on certain terms like qualia it, it could and be done. things like that. It could be done, actually. It can be done. It's an easy way to do it. it I, in terms of, okay, so physicalism today, under physicalists' best uh, models of what the most fundamental level of physical system is, they point to undifferentiated fields of potential, like the Higgs field, that these fields out of which the forces of nature are derived. Well, what is a field but a harmonic oscillator? And what does Schopenhauer identify as the inner nature of will? Or what, what rather represents the will among phenomena? Music, sound waves. So I, it could be argued that there's a kind of esoteric hermeticism lingering in the background of Schopenhauer's system. And the same kind of comparison you could make to Platonism could be mapped directly onto modern physics with these undifferentiated fields occupying the role of the forms and then des descending through the grades of objectification down to complex physical systems. Um, so there's, and Bernardo Kastrup has explored other arguments related to the relational interpretation of Carlo Rivelli. And uh, there's a lot of, of possibilities using Schopenhauer's system to, to interpret physicalism. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a bit much right now to go into in depth, but that possibility is still out there. And I don't think we've exhausted, I don't think we've gotten close to exhausting what Schopenhauer has to offer. I think that we might, see some yeah. kind of renaissance of Schopenhauer's philosophy and just look what it did back in the 1860s. I mean, a lot of very important things happened in Germany when Schopenhauer came to light. Maybe that's a background incidental cause, yeah. you know, maybe, but there were spiritual movements that developed these themes. Um, 
Schopenhauer was the favorite philosopher of a notable mid 20th century political figure. He had a massive impact. He still might have a massive impact and he, he probably is relevant to these, these debates, but perhaps we can leave that to another time. I think it's interesting. To I think he's relevant. Why, yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting to consider why idealism went so much in the 20th century. Um, I mean, you had, I, you did a video on this before Ryan pessimistic mm. idealism, but about the, the, the fall of British idealism. Right. But I mean, it wasn't really, it wasn't really superior arguments that destroyed that school of thought. There exactly. Was, <laughs> you know, it, it's, in, I mean, it's interesting. And that was always something that puzzled me um, when I was studying like the, the positivist movement and British idealism is it's not like there, there was any um, knockdown arguments or any great new insights from the positivists. Yet there was this complete collapse of what was the dominant school of thought, British idealism. There was a complete collapse within a few years and right. it was just, it became completely outmoded, outdated and unfashionable. And you had the, this dominance of, of positivism and um, logic and focus on language for a century. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's, it's interesting to consider, you know, why, why has idealism went so much? Why was the 20th century the century of, of um, positivism and materialism? I think there's probably a deeper reason than any nice. intellectual arguments. It was the real success of science. I mean, the success of science has completely complete, eclipsed philosophy. It's um, mm. it's sort of distracted almost. And one of the really positive developments in analytic philosophy is, uh, I think it really got going with Thomas Nagel's um, article and what's it like to be a bat? I think that's what it's called, which arose this thing called the hard problem of consciousness, which is, okay, science can um, give you kind of this account of you know how certain arrangements of matter um kind of cohere and give form to the world but how does consciousness arise out of that and that's just a, an insoluble problem it's an insurmountable obstacle for uh, materialism and uh, in the analytic in analytic philosophy you're seeing these um debates now you know is matter fundamental and um, there are some serious some you know somewhat serious as serious as analytic philosophy can be um, contributions to that debate regarding idealism. Um, people like Philip Goff, I think. I mean, he has a bit of a wacky view on this, <laughs> but um, but but it's it's becoming clearer and clearer that idealism is the only way you can solve this kind of uh, kind of silly materialism that we've fallen into. Philip yeah. Goff, or uh, Philip Goff, he said that. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it may be cringe. He said that Bertrand Russell did for consciousness what Darwin did for life in the 1920s. That's uh, it, when Russell wrote um, what would have been, the, uh, I believe, the analysis of matter. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think Bertrand Russell, I hate that man. Um, <laughs> he uh, He's very... Um, him and G.E. Moore, they were very significant in turning uh, the tides of philosophic conversation in the early 20th century. So we have, prior to the 20th century, between the 1850s and carrying into like the 19-teens, 20s, and uh, a bit later, so in the 30s as well, just a very, very little bit, we had idealism flourishing in America and in Great Britain. So we had, um, let's see here, so we had uh, F.H. Bradley, Edward Caird, T.H. Green, Bernard Bosid Kay, um, R.B. Haldane, who was um, Lord Chancellor of uh, Great Britain, actually. He was a uh, prominent idealist. Um, we had Herbert Wilden Carr, who uh, translated um, Gentile's works into English. Um, we had R.G. Collinwood, British um, thinker, who also was uh, heavily influenced by Gentile. Um, in America, we had Josiah Royce, um, very um, prominent American uh, thinker, um, objective idealist. Um, communicated with and uh, very good friends with uh, William James and uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, Peirce also being an idealist. 
um, we had this very, very rich tradition that was uh, flourishing at the time. And around the turn of the 20th century, um, Bertrand Russell, so Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore, they both went to uh, Trinity College, Cambridge. And they there they were under the tutelage of J.M.E. McTaggart, um, very famous uh, absolute idealist, um, Hegel scholar, and uh, probably the, the most fascinating, if I may say so, of the British idealists with respect to crafting and um, a unique system of philosophy. It's purely deductive, almost, well, uh, yeah, purely deductive, uh, most of his systems a priori, but um, Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore uh, were taught by McTaggart. They had classes with him. And uh, it's funny, even G.E. Moore, a couple years before his uh, refutation of idealism, he was an idealist and agreed that time was unreal, um, past, present, and future, all unreal. Um, a decade or so later, he, he said he never said such a thing, and he, he <laughs> it, it would be uh, stupid of him to say so. Uh, but yeah, he's he, he never really represented fairly uh, that system, that, that, that tradition, which he claims to have refuted in his, uh, I, th I think it was 1903 uh, article, The Refutation of Idealism, which essentially targets um, Barclay, a misrepresentation of Barclay. Uh, he, he attacks the, the, the idea that to be is to be perceived, or uh, to be is to perceive, um, essay est uh, per kippi. And the articles written by G.E. Moore, so he also attacked Bradley's theory of judgment and a lot of technical matters, so attacks on monism, especially uh, theories of relations, things like that, very, very technical. Um, essentially, it ended in a stalemate with respect to the technicalities. Now, one can say that, and I, I think this is true, that Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore essentially were talking past the idealists. They, they, they set up straw men, attacked the straw men, um, and it never really got anywhere. Uh, one problem was that many idealists, they just died uh, before they had any real time to respond. A lot of them died in quick succession in the 1920s. Um, and this coupled with World War I and anti-German sentiment led to um, a very uh, suspicious attitude towards uh, German philosophy, especially Hegel um, and Schopenhauer to a degree as well, uh, saying that it, it contributed to the, uh, to the start of the war, essentially. Um, this uh, German philosophy it kind of propelled... Um, Germans entry and uh, the German entry into World War One, but uh, it was mostly the uh, the destruction that World War One caused the, the the catastrophic nature of it, which led to a a a um, the, the passing away of any kind of true spiritual view of the world um, with respect to absolute idealism generally, but I'm. Idealism as such. And the attitude that people had, so common people and intellectuals, was really um, unfavorable to any kind of spiritual interpretation of the universe, um, or even metaphysical for that matter, too. So we had the logical positivists attacking the very notion of metaphysics as unmeaning. There's a famous line uh, by A.J. Ayer. Yeah, saying that not even the idealists had any sense of what they were talking about. It was just uh, barren words. Um, so I would actually push back and say that it was the growth of science, really, that led to the um, dismissal of idealism because we had British uh, idealistic philosophers like um, R.B. Haldane, who uh, was embraced the theory of relativity, as well as H.W. Uh, Carr, um, two uh, 
British idealists who emphatically uh, insisted that such advancement uh, advances uh, only strengthened the idealist case. Um, even like, of course, if you want to go down to the whole quantum mechanics route too. I mean, there's people even back then who said that it makes the, it only solidifies the case for idealism. I, I would say that, uh, yeah, it wouldn't have been science per se, but it has to do with the the atmosphere at the time, the social atmosphere, really, and the fact that many of these philosophers died at the time. But uh, I'll I'll turn it, it back was, to you. <laughs> it was a crypto Atlantean conspiracy to suppress <laughs> the third scientific revolution that was taking place in Germany. It had to be squashed. That's why. Facts. <laughs> I'm definitely going like to hear more about that theory. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you can even look at someone like Alfred North Whitehead who wrote the Principia Mathematica with Russell. Perfect. And then in the mid-20th century, he published uh, Process and Reality, which is this incredible work of metaphysics, uh, which is, um, I'd say, panpsychist in nature. It's idealist in nature. Um, and like that's the kind of text. I mean, that was largely ignored in his lifetime as well. Um, there's an increased interest in him in the last few years, but he's still a largely overlooked philosopher. But again, that's the kind of, you know, in terms of science, I mean, he was, uh, he integrated um, some of the novel insights of quantum physics into it. He actually had a competing theory of relativity with Einstein. He was enmeshed in science of philosophy before he turned to metaphysics. He turned to metaphysics quite late in life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, you look at someone like him, and that's someone who, if, had he been around in, in Germany in the 19th century, we might well be talking about him in the same breath as, mm -hmm. as Hegel and Nietzsche. But he's this 20th century analytical British philosopher, and he's publishing this dense text on cosmology and metaphysics, and he largely gets ignored. Um, mm -hmm. So, again, I think that's something that's, that's overlooked. You know, we, we get presented these figures from 20th century philosophy, and it's presented as... Uh, this advance towards materialism and positivism, but there were formidable voices out there and there were arguments that were uh, not being satisfactorily squashed by the positivists and materialists, but that side of things is just overlooked. It's not really, you know, it, it just shows you again, as in the same as in any field of study, you know, it's not the, the best arguments that are winning out. There is something else at play. Definitely. I also think with contemporary accounts of consciousness um, or experience generally, so I I disagree a bit with Schopenhauer's uh, phenomenology of consciousness and experience, but I, I, I do have uh, sympathized with much of what he has to say. Um, I've noticed um, this is very, very prominent, uh, even with um, uh, someone like uh, Thomas Nagel, so Thomas Nagel, uh, in his famous article, What's It Like to Be a Bat? Um, so he, he didn't come up with the phrase, really, what, what it's like. It actually comes, it, it goes back to uh, a few years earlier with uh, the British idealist T.L.S. Sprigg in, his art, in an article that he published about final causes when he was uh, trying to, uh, um, when he speaks about consciousness in the article, he says, well, it's really just what it's like to be something. Um, so uh, it's always kind of funny that um, uh, he gets overlooked, uh, Sprigg. He was a, um, I think it was, a, yeah, Scottish uh, philosopher. Um, and he lived up until, um, so it would have been, like, I think, 2007, 2008 or so. Um, but he actually published a, uh, a work titled The Vindication of Absolute Idealism, which embraces a kind of panpsychist idealism, heavily inspired by Schopenhauer use many of Schopenhauer's arguments um, to advocate for a kind of uh, um, pan-experientialism. And uh, yeah, it was, it was very, um, it's, I think it's online, the book, uh, uh, kind of expensive for a hard copy, but it's available for free though. Yeah, panpsychism is kind of having something of a comeback in yeah, analytic yeah. philosophy as it relates to the hard problem of consciousness. Because it's, it's kind of a, I guess it's kind of a more acceptable form of idealism right. you, know, you mentioned Goff and um, I think Nagel is sympathetic to it. You have someone like Galen Strawson who's a, an analytic philosopher he's a naturalist but he made an argument that to be a consistent naturalist you have to affirm some kind of panpsychism I think even David Chalmers uh, is at least sympathetic to panpsychism 
Um, I think he is a panpsychist. I, the problem I have with these guys is not that they're not on the right track. It's just that I, I, I think that Schopenhauer is kind of pushing in. Um, maybe not entirely, but I feel like basically uh, these guys in analytic philosophy, they're, they're trying to kind of make some, I don't know, kind of awkward relationship with science. So in the case of Philip Goff, he's trying to say that electrons uh, are conscious. Now, I just object to that kind of vocabulary because electrons don't exist kind of in the way that we think that they do. He's kind of taken materialism at face value and he's just kind of slapped consciousness on top. I think it's just, it's coming at it from the wrong way around. Um, so even though they're making kind of progress and they're actually um, starting to overcome this, um, this kind of insoluble materialism, um, I, I, I think it's just, it's going in the wrong direction. Uh, so that, that's what I'd say about that. Yeah, I'd agree the with that. Sh um, Schopenhauer, he kind of empowers the individual thinker by telling them that like truth comes from these faculties that are in you. The understanding of the world comes from the will, which is in you, right? Like you don't have to appeal to some external source of knowledge. Right? His epistemological principles are so common sense. It, it is kind of empowering in a way. And you can see how that tradition in a way is dangerous to elites who want to have a monopoly on privileged sources of knowledge. And so I, I totally agree Schopenhauer is the right tradition uh, to be a part of. I kind of see a lineage between Schopenhauer, Jung, Joseph Campbell spiritually as something that's been really influential for me. Those are the three authors I recommend most often to others. But yeah, it's definitely not exhaustive. There's a lot more to be gained from that tradition. I think we can just about wrap up here. Maybe one thing that would be interesting to cover before we finish is, uh, you know, Nietzsche is obviously someone that's uh, very popular. Um, I'm sure a lot of people listening will be more familiar with Nietzsche than Schopenhauer. Uh, I was just wondering if any of you had any um, comments on the Nietzschean interpretation or misinterpretation of Schopenhauer. Uh, I think he was basically kind of uh, too young, too hot-headed. Um, to, to really kind of, if you read his, um, I forget what it's called. It's, it's not Eke, Eke Homo. It's, uh, Chopin, he, what's it called? Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer as, educator, as I believe. Yeah. Schopenhauer is educated. That's it. Um, he kind of discusses his development. Um, he starts off basically worshiping Schopenhauer. He's like, finally, someone who really understands human psychology. Then he has this kind of uneasiness. He's like, but I, I'm not, I'm not ascetic, you know, I, I have these kind of passions, uh, these impulses. And so he kind of turns that into a philosophy. And I think, I think basically everyone in youth does that. The difference is Nietzsche was a genius. Um, he was classically educated and he kind of created this very formidable philosophy. Um, but, you know, as he grew older, um, well, actually, I mean, he kind of turned insane. So he didn't really have the normal human development but you know at, at the very end of his life you can see him fall into this kind of crazed compassion which maybe says something but um you know i i do think it's just this kind of immature volatility but he was a genius and so it's kind of he's he's this kind of constant formidable problem which i think he's i think he he's going to inform uh the the debate but i also think he's going to mislead a lot of people I just see him as incredibly egoistic, taking Schopenhauer's personality faults and exacerbating them, while at the same time um, taking that kind of path of affirmation of will, which, to be fair, Schopenhauer does leave open. At the end of the world as will and representation, Schopenhauer makes sure to, to state, like, there's no rational reason that I can give you why, from a philosophical perspective, why you ought to follow the path of renunciation rather than affirmation. I, he, he basically says he's just describing uh, from a standpoint of pure knowledge how this works. And Nietzsche takes that opening to go his own way, affirm himself. And um, the, the seeds are totally there in Schopenhauer for that Nietzschean turn. But I think history has borne out the results of it. And, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think everyone goes through a Nietzschean phase because we're all egoists when when we're young. We're all hot headed for a time, um, and so I think it, he can still be a kind of helpful example for people. And he he has good observations. Obviously, he was a genius. But yeah, it, reading Schopen, it, reading Nietzsche without Schopenhauer is a big fault for a lot of people, and Schopenhauer corrects a lot of the the errors in Nietzsche. All right, I think that's a good place to leave off. Uh, this was a great conversation. I'll include links to everyone that participated in the description. And yeah, if any of you have any uh, final thoughts, I'd be happy to leave it there. This was uh, a lot of fun. Good, uh, it was great speaking. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Keith. It was fun. All right.